Uh, we'll now proceed with our next panel. This will be a discussion entitled Understanding Clinical Trials. This panel will feature Dr. Tomas Carroll, a senior lecturer in the Department of Medicine based in the Irish Center for Genetic Lung Disease at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. He has been chief scientist with the Alpha One Foundation Ireland since 2004. Ms. Geraldine Kelly, Kelly is the CEO of uh, Alpha One Foundation Ireland. She provides comprehensive guidance and support to Alpha One patients and their families nationally. Ms. Kelly collaborates with the research teams at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland to promote research into Alpha One and access to clinical trials for emerging therapies. They are joined by Daniel Grimm, who is an AlphaNet coordinator here in the United States. He's an Alpha, uh, he's an Alpha One patient who actively participates in clinical trials. So Dr. Carroll, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks very much, Randall. And it's a pleasure to be here and to, to talk to everybody. Some fasc fascinating discussions already today. Um, myself and Geraldine in particular are honored to be involved. And we'd just like to say from the outset that we're far from experts on this topic, but we'll hope to share some of our experiences around clinical trials and help people on the call who may, may be newly diagnosed alphas understand the area of clinical trials a little bit better. But we do have a patient expert, Daniel Grimm, who's uh, joined us and, and Daniel is taking part in a study. So first I'll, I'll, I'll let Daniel introduce himself to, to the rest of the group. Well, uh, my name is Dan Grimm. I'm from Buffalo, New York, and I, I've been a diagnosed alpha for about five years. And I just in the last year, I became interested in doing a clinical trial. And after doing some research and speaking with my physicians, it was deemed I was medically appropriate for me to participate. And then I, I got in touch with uh, the foundation through their uh, webpage and looked up some clinical trials and decided on one in uh, Columbia Medical Center with uh, Dr. Darmiento, which I just completed. A very positive experience for me. And uh, you know, a couple of things you got to keep in mind is uh, before you agree to participate, you should find out uh, if you're a candidate, you know, you got to get the criteria, see what the goals are of the, uh, the trials, and then uh, determine with the uh, clinicians if you're uh, a good candidate. And I, I was deemed a good candidate, and uh, I just completed it, and it was, uh, again, a very positive experience. Congratulations, Dan. And I if I can introduce, uh, let Geraldine introduce herself next. Sure. Um, Geraldine Kelly, I'm the CEO uh, for the Alpha One Foundation in Ireland. And as Tomas said, um, I don't have a huge amount of experience with clinical trials, but having spoken to a number of our patients and been involved with patients over the last three or four years, I know that um, clinical trials are something that are always of interest to our patients with Alpha One for many reasons. Um, and I suppose it's great to hear that Daniel is saying that his experiences were positive because I think uh, listening to uh, Dr. Brantley recent, just there in the last few minutes talking about the number of trials that are coming our way over the, over the next or possible trials over the, the coming months or maybe even year, it's, it's, it's a, an encouraging thing to think that um, patients like Daniel can participate, have a have a good experience, and are willing to, um, you know, to take part because it's one thing that we know is a certainty. Without the participants, without the clinical trials, without the pharmaceutical companies, we're not going to make any progress in um, treating alpha patients, but also finding a cure for alpha one. Thanks, Geraldine. I guess the, the point of today's discussion is to try and keep it informal and just try and um, keep it open and, and frank mm -hmm. and, and sh share our experiences. But personally, and myself and Geraldine would work closely together in Dublin, and we are involved in, in a nationwide detection program. So we, you know, we're responsible for somebody getting their diagnosis and getting it properly, uh, promptly, rapidly, and the, that the doctor who orders the test gets the right support and information, because sometimes the doctor, as many people will be aware, doesn't know a lot about alpha one. So we want to see people who are diagnosed, you know, getting that diagnosis as early as possible, getting the right information and then the right care and treatment. And unfortunately, Ireland is one of the countries where augmentation therapy is not widely available for, for alphas. So, you know, the topic of clinical trials is really close to our hearts because we know it can be somebody's first shot or the best way for an alpha to get um a chance at a new drug or, or treatment. 
Um, but I, I guess, Geraldine, maybe if I asked you about why, why clinical trials are so important for alpha-1, we've touched upon how augmentation therapy is not available in a lot of countries, and there's no specific treatment for the liver disease yet caused by alpha-1. So there are a number of unique challenges. You know, we, you have to you first have to be diagnosed with alpha-1 and you may live in a country or region where testing is not taking place um, very often. You next have to find a doctor who knows a lot about alpha-1 and is knowledgeable about clinical research and clinical trials. And finally, as, as Dan uh, touched on there, you have to fit a list of special conditions or inclusion criteria. And if you meet these criteria, then you may be considered suitable for the clinical trial. So Geraldine, wearing your patient organization hat, what, what role do you think um, patient organizations could play or should play in the clinical trials process? Um, well, I guess I have a presentation. If it's OK, I can share it and go through some of my thoughts on clinical trials. And I'll cover cover that to, you know, um, how the, the the organization, the Alpha One Foundation in Ireland or in any of the countries can um, work with the pharma companies and with the patients to try and um, I suppose, smooth the process, but also make it a much more positive experience. Can I share that, Tomas? Are you okay with that? Yeah. yeah. So I suppose really um, from my perspective and just listening to um, the, the input from other participants today on the call, I think that um, without willing participants, there can be no, no clinical trials, obviously. Without pharmaceutical companies, there uh, can be no new treatments or therapies. So for me, collaboration between participants, patient organizations and pharma will lead to clinical trials with um, more positive outcomes for all parties. Generally, um, participants um, are invited to take part in a clinical trial, are very happy to do so and have mainly a positive um, experience. Most hope to, um, most hope to, have a positive health outcome from those trials. Um, but in general, um, a lot don't do it for themselves, but do it for their families and for the future generations, particularly when the condition is genetic, like alpha one. So I suppose the thing, you know, about the trials is that um, participation is, is extremely important. And we, we know that through collaboration between all parties involved were going to, you know, improve the whole process. Um, so one thing that um, is part of a clinical trial process is, is the very beginning, I suppose, the ethics approval. Ethics approval is extremely import important. Um, it can seem like a, a chore. I've been involved in um, preparing some ethics documents and they're pretty robust. But it shouldn't be a chore because it's an important step in protecting both the participants, the researchers, in um, preparing a really good and, and robust trial and, and protects um, everybody, helps to ensure the clinical trials move safely from design, recruitment to testing, uh, proving a product or, a, or um, uh, proving a product's effectiveness and um, publishing the findings, getting their treatments approved. Um, a part of the, the the um, process, which I'm sure Daniel had to participate in, was the informed consent piece. Um, that's critical. Um, during this particular part of the process, uh, the patient needs to know everything there is to know about the trial, how it will operate, how long it will take, um, what the expected outcomes are, the, the care plan for the patient while they're on the trial. And this is all before signing the consent. Um, it's pretty important part and a pretty important stage in the whole process. Um, so um, in, in any trial, I think there's an important piece to consider, and that is that simple language is used when providing information to participants. Um, technical language can be very, can prove very difficult. Um, it can also increase the amount of time it takes to get uh, through the whole process. So I think from the pharmaceutical company's point of view, it's important that when, um, when information leaflets and information is being dispersed, it's done in a way that is 
simple for people to understand. Um, always for the patient, they need to seek clarification when necessary. Don't accept what's written down on a page if you don't understand it. Involve family in a review of the information because your family will see or maybe um, be able to understand things that you don't see or in some instances have very valid questions to present to uh, the, the team involved. Um, understanding the inclusion and exclusion criteria, this is important. Quite often that's done with the medical team. Um, it's not something you necessarily have to um, understand completely yourself, but in terms of identifying suitable patients for a registry, a medical team will often be involved in helping uh, to identify whether or not you have, um, whether you fit within an age bracket, whether you have uh, comorbidities that may actually prevent you from being part of the, the treatment, whether you're already on uh, therapies or medication that prevents you from taking part. Uh, seeking advice from the medical team and your family doctor is important. It's important for your family doctor to be involved and understand what it is you're taking part in and that, and that those um, are, can, are regularly updated throughout the trial on how things are progressing and whether or not you're, you're being faced with any difficulties. Um, understand the frequency of medical monitoring. So throughout the whole process of a trial, um, you will have perhaps monthly or bi-monthly, three-monthly meetings with um, the team to see how the therapy, how you're responding to the therapy, understand any difficulties you might be having and deciding whether or not um, you should continue on the trial or whether the expected outcomes are um, as they thought they might be. Um, also understanding how you're going to be compensated for expenses, because quite often being involved in a clinical trial involves um, traveling to a center for blood tests, for perhaps uh, other diagnostic treatments. And it's important to understand from your perspective whether or not they're going to be covered. Normally they are in the case of clinical trials, travel expenses, maybe um, out of work expenses are covered. And then understand what will happen if you have to leave the trial early. Um, in some situations, um, participants can't continue to participate in a trial and they need to understand what will happen to their care in the initial um, period of time after that. And always be clear on what will happen when the trial ends, particularly when it comes to therapies that you may have been uh, taking um, may have had a beneficial effect for you, but um, it's not always the case that at the end of a trial, uh, you will continue on that treatment. Most of the time you won't. And that's a situation that needs to be understood. Um, don't confuse clinical monitoring during a trial with your ongoing medical treatment. It's there are two different things. Um, quite often the treatment or the, the monitoring that takes place during a trial is uh, very targeted and very robust. Not saying that your medical treatment isn't, but it might not, you might not receive tests in the same level of frequency during your normal me uh, medical treatment. And that's something to, you know, bear in mind. Um, join the National Patient Registry You've met, we've heard talk about the registry and the importance of the registry. Um, certainly in Ireland, our registry data is often used to help um, to match the inclusion and exclusion criteria for a trial. We also have quite up to date information for a lot of our patients, clinical information on past CTs and ultrasounds, information that might become very re relevant to the medical team or to the team involved in, in, the, uh, in the trial. Um, so a, a very important thing to note is that licensing does not guarantee reimbursement. And this has also been discussed in the last um, section of the of the talks. There's a huge difficulty getting new treatments and therapies through a country's reimbursement process. Um, uh, a lot of new treatments and therapies are cost prohi prohibitive for a lot of countries in Europe. Um, the um, organizations, the uh, bodies that actually approve drugs, um, it's already been mentioned about, uh, you know, quality measures and whether or not treatments are uh, effective and therefore 
um, are seen to be worth um, funding is something that's a, a very uh, emotive topic in a lot of countries in Europe. Um, and another thing, augmentation therapy has been approved since I suppose around about, I think it was the mid 1980s. Um, and it's still not reimbursed in most European countries, although approved by the FDA and the European Med Medicines Agency. And so far to date, we've known new therapies or medicines since then. That's why I'm so excited to see that there's so much coming. Um, I hope that in, in terms of the trials that happen, um, that cost can be considered uh, and, and the process involved in most countries to um, have these treatments um, approved and reimbursed will be taken into consideration. Um, one thing that I think would be of great benefit to, um, to trials would be the engagement by pharma with patients and patient organizations as early as the clinical trial design stage. Um, I think um, patients have an awful lot of value to add purely because they've been involved in previous trials. They know what works. They know what the um, opportunities are to improve those trials. And Daniel will probably be able to speak a little bit more about this. Um, so I think that engagement with a patient organization who has a lot of experience of many patients and uh, their challenges um, would certainly be a very good, a very good starting point. And, and an end-to-end -end involvement is crucial to developing a strong partnership between participants, patient organizations, and pharma. And I think that communicating findings back to a patient, so a patient summary would help patients understand the outcomes and the true value of their participation and give them a sense of real partnership in the process. Um, I think for me, study participants are the un unsung heroes of medical advancements. I, there are just some thoughts I had on, on clinical trials and how, um, how we, um, how, you know, how I think patients might feel going through the process and some thoughts on what I think might improve it for, uh, for future trials, you know, coming up over the next number of years. Thank you, Geraldine. I'm, I'm sure Dan was nodding at some of your points there, but it sounds like your experience, Dan, was was, was very positive. Um, well, yeah, and I just wanted to state that uh, the, the patient's physical safety is paramount in all these studies. And I, I received extensive testing and every time I went for a visit. I, you know, a lot of blood work, uh, PFTs, different things, just to make sure I wasn't regressing in my health. And uh, that, that's always the most important thing for a patient to know and trust that they're going to be safe going through these trials. And, uh, you know, some of the benefits I had, I, you know, I, I get to consult with and have Alpha One expert doctors, you know, physically interacting with me. And, you know, I, I, I received a lot of education on this. I, I learned a lot more about Alpha One during this trial. And it's, you know, it's just... Uh, after you get through a trial, you can see how satisfying it is to maybe maybe make a difference in finding a new therapy or um, hopefully a cure. Thanks, Dan. We had a great question come in on, on chat there. That what was the most challenging thing you found in, in about taking part in, in the, the study? Well, I mean, the travel was a little bit. And then, you know, I had to be fasting before I got there. So there was a, you know, I almost as soon as I had my blood work done, I would eat almost every time, you know, but uh, you know, there's physical challenges. Everybody travels a little differently. How far you have to travel makes a difference. Uh, you know, your ability to get in and, out, in and out of the centers makes a difference. So, I mean, I, I'd say that's probably the most challenging thing. And, and were, were you nervous before you, you, you started, before you decided to, to jump in? Well, I, I think, you know, the first initial visit I was, you know, cause I wasn't sure exactly what was going to happen, but uh Certainly, Dr. Darmiento's office was fantastic. Everybody there was just made it so easy for me to participate. And uh, the education that they gave me before I started and what to expect was a big thing. You know, it's it's reassuring. Yeah. And I guess you, you've been out the other end now. So you've taken part in, and you've, you've completed your participation. And, and looking back, is there anything you think could improve the process for people maybe taking part in studies after you? 
I'm not sure if I can identify any one thing. You know, it's uh, it's probably going to be different at every center, I imagine. But, uh, you know, uh, there was a point that uh, Geraldine made about finding results out at the end of the study. And I, I've talked to other people that have participated that never had any indication what came of the study. And that's very mm -hmm. important. If you're going to participate in this, you yeah. want to know somehow what your participation mm -hmm. meant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the studies and trials couldn't take part without your help and input. So at a simple courtesy level, it would be nice to find out, you know, what, what happened to the study and was it successful? Exactly. Mm -hmm. I think, Geraldine, you, you spoke to a colleague of ours who's a research nurse, and she mentioned something really interesting that we kind of hadn't thought about before, that the motivations behind people when they decide to take part. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess, you know, my my sort of thoughts were that for most people taking part in a trial, you, you're doing it because you want to feel well, you want to have a result for yourself and your own health. And she said, although that is on people's minds, mostly um, um, participants in a research um, study are doing it because they want to try and make a difference. They want to try and um, help produce a fix for their own children, their grandchildren, because particularly with alpha one, something like alpha one, it's genetic. So they know there are going to be family members who um, will inherit this genetic condition and, you know, want them to be able to look forward to a treatment that will work and help them become, you know, um, live longer, live a better life and and sooner rather than later because that's often the case with alpha patients it's later on in life when um you know they start to feel the effects and then need the treatment so i think um, that that was something that she said you know she said very it, it's not very often that they that she will talk to a patient that you know just says look i you know i just want to feel well it's it's usually anything i can do to try and find a a result is you know is worth doing so um, I, I have great, great respect and um, for anybody who's taking part in a clinical trial. And I definitely feel that um, it's, uh, you know, you should be applauded and, and uh, continue to do it. I, it's wonderful. <laughs> well, thank you. You know, you know it's, uh, that's, that was kind of my motivation on this, you know, and I, I think as more of us are identified as alphas and we can talk to our younger generations coming forward, you can alter their lifestyles and make, you know, healthy changes yeah. and, and hopefully just slow the, uh, the advancement of any kind of uh, negative uh, medical things like that. But, but uh, you know, this is a very exciting time for new therapies and uh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm very excited to participate in trying to find some new yeah. therapies. We had one question, Randall, maybe I could just address before we wrap up. Um, Karen asked, how can patients ensure they know the personal potential risk um, depending on the phases of, of a clinical trial and what are the roles of each phase of a clinical trial as this is directly linked to a uh, potential risk? And Dan, if, if you wanted to answer that, but I think it comes back to communication with the clinician and with the center you're attending um, and the quality of the information you're given, you know, that, that the risks are clearly out outlined and and all the safety tests that have been done to get to this point. Well, I, I felt informed when I uh, before I started, and uh, you know we we did discuss that. And uh, you know, if at any time I didn't feel safe doing this, I probably would have pulled out. But uh, I was very reassured on how I was treated. Again, my medical care was fantastic, and you know, with all the testing, they went over all the results with me every time I went there. And you know, any kind of deviation in any blood analysis or anything was explained to me and, you know, what may be causing this or how it was, uh, you know, affecting me. And I, I, just, I just was very confident in the, the care I received and I was able to continue on, you know, without any real concern. I, I know you're a, a support group leader in your own area and you're you're in regular contact with a large group of, of alphas and, and would, would education around clinical trials be good or would knowledge and awareness of clinical trials? Because, you know, some sometimes people are, they have this myth that, you know, they talk about guinea pigs and you'll be treated like a guinea pig. And that's far from the truth. That's probably the first word I hear every time I, I yeah. tell you, you know, but, 
I think education would help on this. I tried, you know, when I talk to my people, I talk to about 150 alphas every month. And uh, I, I explained my experience with them. And that's one of the reasons I did this is so I could explain to it firsthand. And, um, you know, most of them are receptive to that. And it goes back to Geraldine's point that we want to make it better for our, our future generations, you know. And, uh, you know, some of us are at an age where it, it may not make that much of a difference to us, but for our families behind us, it would. Yeah, exactly, Daniel, well said. Can I just make a plug for the, the Alpha One Foundation in the US have a, have a superb uh, Clinical Trials 101 webpage, which a lot of people in Europe who are alphas mightn't be aware of because sometimes navigating the phrases and terminology around clinical trials can be difficult. And they also have a, on the, the, the alpha1.org website, they have a find a trial search engine as well. So, you know, if you're a newly diagnosed alpha in a country, maybe where there is no specialist center that at least people can go on go online and, and get their information from a trusted source and look up the, the trials that are ongoing around around the world it's a great resource yeah it is mm, yeah. yeah randall i can see you trying to jump in i was just gonna i was, wasn't sure if you wanted to ask but i was actually really gonna thank you for plugging that program because uh, <laughs> it's actually <laughs> it's actually really important to the foundation i mean we basically cultivate the information from clinicaltrials.gov i mean there's a lot of information there and it's sometimes it's very technical and so basically we co collated that information into one location and that website um, and that database is updated frequently so thank you for for pointing that out no, no problem. And can I can I plug another US body that came to Dublin, Ireland three years ago and ran a really good clinical trials information session. They're called the, the Center for Information and, and Study on Clinical Research P Participation. And they're a US nonprofit and their mission is to educate people about clinical trials. So they, they actually ran a, a public information session in Dublin three years ago and it was really well attended. And I think they're they're traveling to other European European countries to raise awareness of clinical trials for people with a whole host of, it doesn't matter if you, what condition you have, just so people aren't, aren't afraid of the phrase clinical trial and um, people are you know, appropriately educated and, and aware of the, the power and the potential of taking part. No, thank you for that. I mean, that was a great discussion. Um, I, we love, I love the interaction and, and, and um, real honesty of, of participating in clinical trials. You know, as a rare disease, it's very important for people to be aware and be educated about Alpha one because patients are needed to participate in clinical trials. So great job, everyone. And, and that was a great session. Thank you for everything. Thanks, Thanks for having me. And uh, if I need a plug, I'm coming to see Thomas. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> I sound Thank like you. an electrician. <laughs> Thanks, Daniel. Thank you. Thanks Thank you again to, to all of you.